this track started off from what was originally an old sketch that I didn't use, but I really liked the chords in it. And they became like the basis for gravity. So yeah, I'll just play you that quick sketch now. I really thought it had a vibe and I remember traveling to Berlin for a show and I had these chords swimming around in my head. This vocal idea just kept popping into my head and over the course of the journey, uh, like when I was at the airport and like waiting to check in and stuff, I was like recording these uh, vocal ideas into my phone, into the voice notes. And as the journey progressed, the song kind of kept developing. And um, yeah, in true Berlin style, my, my set time wasn't until like four in the morning. So I had loads of time to kill at the hotel. I basically just recorded like a scratch vocal there in the hotel on my laptop and it, it was pretty rough. Um, uh, but yeah, I kind of felt like the, the track had something and I've actually got that original recording, which uh, I'll play to you a little bit later. That track idea that I mentioned, the old sketch that I used actually ended up turning into a sort of atmospheric pad, which is this. And that's sort of running through the track and sort of acts as like a atmospheric bed. And I tend to use that technique quite a lot uh, to help sort of fill up space and build some kind of like filmic atmosphere. Um, and yeah, just to expand a little bit on that. Um, so what's actually going on there is the entire track basically running through reverbs, filters and delays. And I've got this rack here, which I built, which is essentially reverb, filter and delay. And what it allows me to do is just sort of, I call it underwater because it kind of sounds like it's you know, buried underwater. And yeah, I use that so much in my productions. You know, if I hear like like a lead sound or a synth sound, I, I like to hear what it sounds like if it were to be sort of submerged, as it were. I suppose one of the most distinctive elements of the intro was the ARP melody, um, which only features once in the track. I really wanted to like set the tone of the track with with quite a hooky melody, um, but something quite ethereal and spacey. But the, the first sound that I went for was this. Which really wasn't the right vibe. I mean, it, it's definitely a bit too mallety, a bit too sort of like almost intentionally retro for what would become quite a sort of spacey, you know, sci-fi inspired track. What it ended up becoming was actually a sound I created on my Prophet 6, which is over here. And um, this tends to happen quite a lot in tracks where if I'm not really feeling the sound that I've created in the box, and in this case it was um, in Serum, I'll look for inspiration elsewhere. So the Prophet's been great for that. I actually ended up using the Prophet to replace a lot of the parts in this track. And usually I can find some sort of a sound that might inspire me um, just by kind of breaking outside the box every now and then. In addition to that, I've got this kind of beep. I mean, it isn't really doing much, but it, it just sort of adds to the soundscape. I've got a bass patch underpinning everything. So just on the tonic. Again, that's um, a sound which I made in the Prophet. And if I just take off some of the effects here, I've got one layer which is an octave up and another layer which is below. And then you combine them, you kind of get this nice unison effect. And then I've added some like Echo, Echo Boy, which I really rate. And then the Valhalla Vintage. As I go through the track, guitars feature quite prominently. And I wanted to get some of that aesthetic into the intro. Um, just kind of help set the scene a bit. And um, yeah, so I added some acoustic guitar. So it's actually a combination of live recorded guitar. It's a nice steel string and a combination of sound library guitar. 
And the library I used for that is the amazing session guitarist, Strummed Acoustic. Yeah, I mean, it's very convincing, I've, I've got to say, um, and very easy to program. I mean, here it's just a, a basically a, a cluster of MIDI notes. It is quite a subtle detail. I've got it quite low in the mix. And then when you hear that in context with the rest, I've also got this pad layer here going on, which if you have a keen ear, you may recognize from my track Freefall. And I like to do that quite a lot in my productions because I like to create or include a reference to an older song or, or to have kind of like trademarks to create a sense of familiarity. And this track felt a lot like Coming Home where over 10 years ago I made Freefall and that track to me sort of felt like a sound that was really me and this track as well gave me that feeling too so i kind of wanted to create a bit of a a hark back to that song and, and to sort of um you know create a link between the two music wise that's more or less the intro i've also got this kind of reversed in addition to that i've got the drums which are kind of unusual sounding They're basically a combination of live elements and electronic elements, and I'll uh, just expand a bit on how I put those together. The first layer is uh, kick drum. And that was created in kick two. It's a plugin that I really, really like. I just wanted to, like a clean, fundamental. A kick drum you kind of feel rather than here. We've got a rim shot here, which is a live rim shot. So we've just got that and then a reverb layer too. And often I like to bounce down my reverb layers just to sort of like keep them under control. And then I've added the uh, vintage verb. Very, very tight decay on that, on chamber. Okay, and then I'm fairly sure that's like a, a techno drum loop, which I've then sped up to 174 BPM and then applied some filtering to it. So. Again, if I, if I turn off the processing here. Yeah, so it's kind of chopped up, looped, frozen, and then I've added. So taking away all the tops, all of those, put it into mono. And I've used LFO tool here as like a gate. And I do that a lot to control sort of attack and release of certain sounds or to create sort of like choppy loops out of drum patterns. And then this one here is creating a groove, kind of like a pumpy groove. Like, so that is essentially mirroring what the kick drum is doing. So it's ducking out on the kick drum. And yep, just boosted it up a little bit. And then we've got Pro-Q 3 here kind of like my workhorse EQ. We've also got Chain Shaper here, which um, is a plugin I absolutely love. It's like a Max for Live effect. And what that is doing is it's ducking to the rim shot. As you can see here, that yellow line is where it's reading the transient of the audio input I select. And what it then enables you to do is draw in an LFO tool style curve which will then trigger every time the transient hits. So it's a super clean way of achieving sidechain compression um, with the benefits of LFO tool, but also being able to route it to audio where previously you would have to use MIDI. And I've actually used all of those techniques in this project, so I'll delve into those a little bit later. And then next we've got these claps here, which is, you know, kind of like a typical metric sound. It's just a 909 clap, rolled off the lows, rolled off the tops. We've got Echo Boy here, giving us a nice sort of like spacey delay, almost like a dub delay. And then yeah, very simply just vintage verb. Yeah, this, I wanted this to be like a big arena 
sort of feel. So again, long decays, the presets are, are a good starting point, you know, and I'm not going to be snobby about, you know, using presets, not using presets because they get the job done. And this one is SP Amazing Vocal by Don Gunn, which sounds great in vocals, also in drums. Give it a go. Then we've got Sennheiser with that lovely sort of lasery sample. Um, absolutely love their sample packs. Go check them out. And again, exactly the same processing here. Could have grouped it, could have busted it, but I didn't, so oh well. I felt like the drums needed a little bit more processing just to kind of get them up to the level I wanted them to be at. The UAD EMT 250, which, uh, yeah, I absolutely love this reverb. Um, it's got a real vintage sound to it. That's just placing these sounds in a room. So when it comes to like, engineering drum sounds from scratch, you know, until you put reverb on them, they only exist in the digital domain. But obviously very important to kind of give real realism to this sound and give them space. So that's really what this reverb is doing here. Um, I've then got Isotope Trash, which, yeah, it's kind of like saturating a bit and just sort of bringing out a few more harmonics in the sound to get it a bit more upfront, a bit more present. Fab Filter Pro C. So again, that's just sort of squashing the dynamics down a little bit. Not by much, just a tickle, just a little bit of glue. And then finally, Isotope Maximizer. So that's kind of like crushing down a few of the peaks, as you can see here on my analyzer. It's bringing the level up a bit and it's just keeping everything nice and controlled, nothing too major. I'm gonna delve into the vocal right now. I mean, it's such a large part of this project. I think you'll find the process quite interesting. This is what the vocal sounded like before the processing. Obviously post Melodyne, which I did in a different project. We slip away, yeah. I first start off with a bit of DSing. The Pro DS is pretty awesome. We slip away, yeah. So there's about 4.5 decibels of gain reduction on the S's there. I then go into we slip away. Just to roll off a bit of the low end, and sometimes I do quite broad brush strokes at this stage, just if there's anything particularly problematic, any really, really harsh, like room resonances or anything like that, I'll just duck them out on, on this one. But in this case, uh, the vocals uh, recorded quite well. Um, then going into the CLA 76. We slip away. Bit of like brutal compression slamming there. Maybe a little bit harder than I would normally go for, but yeah, I mean, it, it kind of worked. And then we've got this parallel EQ here, the Jack Joseph Puig, if that's the right pronunciation. And yeah, this 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 sounds great. We slip away, yeah. I'm really pushing like 6K there, more or less. It even sounds really sweet if you sort of head up to kind of like nine and 10 if you're looking for extra air. We slip away. We slip away, yeah. That's really giving the vocal a, a bit of nice presence there. And then um, I like to run the vocal into Decapitator. We slip away, yeah. To give it a bit of anger, a bit of aggression. And like the, the mic I use is the Neumann TLM 102, which is like super clinical, super clean. It's good to kind of grit things back up again uh, in post. I kind of like to do things that way around rather than using valve microphones. Bit of multiband compression. I'm using the C6 less these days, so you usually go for the Pro MB, but um, we slip away, yeah. that's controlling a little bit of that kind of nosiness around 128. We slip away. And again, like almost a bit of DSing at the top there as well, just to kind of keep those tops, keep those low mids nice and controlled. We slip away. Again, running into another DSer. We slip away, yeah. So I'm slamming quite hard into the limiter here. We slip away. A vocal like this, which is kind of a big dance vocal, I, I like to keep the dynamics quite controlled and quite compressed. And especially when you're kind of layering things up, you want everything to be quite a nice uniform amplitude. Individually, obviously, these sounds might sound a little bit hard and a bit pushed, but when you hear them in context of the rest of the vocal arrangement, it kind of makes sense. The CLA 2A, um, you know, some engineers might tell you it's a cardinal sin to put a compressor after a limiter, but it sounded right when I was doing it, so that's what I did.
we are replicating the same processing chain across the three lead vocals here. Um, also just to like bring this up too. Um, obviously I'd melodyne these vocals in Logic before I put them into the Ableton project. I also like to just add a bit of auto-tune just to round off. You might not even hear the difference too much, but it's amazing how highly tuned the human ear is to subtle dissonances in tuning. I pretty much use every note in the scale of D minor with the exception of B flat. So I've just removed that one out of the equation just to remove any risk of it sort of ending up there. Um, and again, that's sort of duplicated across all of the vocal parts, uh, more or less. The hard pan double tracks on the side, uh, they're about 10 decibels lower than the lead vocal. They don't need to be too loud. It's just to get that width. Uh, the harmony, you know, again, more or less the same processing going on there. I wanted it up in the mix along with the main lead vocal. So that is our kind of individual layer processing. I now want to sort of talk about what I've got going on with the bus processing. So down here with all my buses, I've got all of my effects that I like to use. I then use the sends here to dial in as much or as little of those effects that I need or want. And I'll just go through those one by one to show you what's happening on my bus. So first off, we've got Echo Boy doing a delay. We slip away, yeah. Let gravity define. We're falling through the lie. That's doing a nice delay there, a nice sort of ping pong delay. And I've got this long delay here, which I kind of use as, as an effect kind of like later on in the arrangement, but not straight away. But then after that, I've got the another delay with Echo Boy running into the MXR um, flanger doubler by UAD, which is like an amazing vintage flanger doubler. And, and actually, like, it's pretty much my go-to for any flange effects because it, it really does get the job done nicely. We slip away, yeah. Let gravity define. We're falling through the lie. Yeah, so what you can hear there, that those delay tails are, are really kind of swirly and to give it some rim reverb, I've used the Abbey Road uh, plate here, which kind of sounds expensive. Um, I think I was like, try, I was alternating that with the EMT 250. We slip away, yeah. Which is a bit cleaner, but I, I wanted something just a little bit more or springy, a bit more lively, so the Abbey Road worked nicely there. I then got the H3000, um, actually, I lie, it was the H3000, but I changed it to Soundboy's Micro Shift, which pretty much does the same thing. Basically pans uh, like multiple um, duplicates of the signal to create width. We slip away, yeah. Let gravity define. We're falling through the lie. That's given me a bit of extra width there, which I like. And it and it kind of sounds a bit chorusy. You can mess around with these different styles here. And then, uh, yeah, the Morph Fader, which I use so much on my vocals because it's a really good way of like adding sort of artificial top end and, and even really like to give it quite a sort of like humanoid uh, feel. We can hear there, it's kind of like a whisper. You can get there actually really quickly by, uh, there's a preset here called Whisper and essentially uses like white noise uh, for the vocoder. Almost eerie, whispery, ethereal uh, layer to the vocal, which I really like. I'm only sending the, the lead vocal there. Because if I was to add more of them, it sort of loses a bit of its definition and a bit of its clarity. So I, I usually just send like, because it's quite, it, it widens the sound as well, the more photos. So I quite like to, you know, just keep that like a single voice just to keep it focused. Okay, and then next we've got, yeah, the long verb. And that's actually not doing anything at the moment, but I think like later on in the uh, vocal arrangement, I did reverb throw in places. Next up we got um, Bloom. So 
usually I have like in, in addition to my sort of much tighter room reverb I'll have like a very sort of long spacey reverb to just sort of like give it that like epic ambience and almost turn the vocal into a pad if you like and yeah again Valhalla Shimmer that's the one for this because yeah just very long clean smooth reverbs Yeah, so that's sounding pretty cool. Finally, in the chain, I've got CLA effects, which is what I'm using to give the vocal quite a lot of like intentional grit. Again, I've just got like the one voice um, feeding into this one. And yeah, I, I like this, this effect. Um, it just it gives the, the vocal a bit more aggression. We slip away, yeah. Kind of adds to that rocky feel. And yeah, this track had a very like metal rock vibe to it. So, you know, it made a lot of sense to sort of dial in this quite quite a lot. We slip away, yeah. And you know, if I push the send a little bit more, you can hear it driving into the... We slip away, yeah. Hear it driving into the distortion quite nicely. And yeah, there's a few other little things going on there. You know, we've got... A little bit of phase, a bit of short delay. It takes that signal, it kind of creates a bit of a, a slap delay left and right, and it's allowing that sound to kind of occupy a bit more of the stereo field. And you end up getting a few little artifacts here and there where it might sort of like phase or it might sort of like clash a little bit with some of the other layers you've got on the side. And it's like those little imperfections that kind of take that vocal out of squeaky clean territory and into sort of like more interesting and audibly uh, exciting territory. And there's a few bits and pieces on that chain. Um, I've, I've driven that quite hard into the CLA 76 compressor. It's some pretty mad like EQ curves taking place there because I think, yeah, it sounded a little bit nasally um, around the 200. And quite a harsh resonance. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's just taking out that nasty resonance there and just boosting up that that, that presence because when I had it we slip away, yeah. when I had it against the lead vocal, I was really kind of craving that area there. We slip away, yeah. yeah, so it just brings the shine up a little bit more. Got another EQ doing a, a similar thing. At that point, I'd identified another we slip away, yeah. quite annoying frequency there. We slip away, yeah, again, just another curve here. We slip away, yeah. Just run through these kind of bus effects in sequence just so you can hear what they're doing as they're building up. We slip away, yeah. Let gravity defy. We're falling through the lie. We slip away, yeah. Let gravity defy. We're falling through the lie. We slip away, yeah. Let gravity defy. We fall through the lie. We slip away, yeah. Let gravity defy. We fall through the lie. Yeah, just to like have a little look at my routing because there's some interesting stuff going on there typically with a vocal production project I'll route all of the dry vocals that will say dry I mean before they go to the buses after they've had their track effects added into this own channel here we slip away yeah that way I can audition the vocal dry without the effects we slip away and then what I'll do is I'll take all these buses and I'll then route them into vocal bus to give them their own channel. So the beauty of that is it allows me to control the entire signal. Almost like a dry wet. Um, something else I might do is use something like track spacer and then essentially route the dry vocals into track spacer. We slip away, yeah. 
Gravity if things are starting to get really muddy, um, I can then create more space by using an effect like track spacer to carve out more room against the dry signal. Okay, so moving into the processing I've got on the vocal group, which is essentially like all of the effects, all the buses and, the, and everything just in the same group here. We slip away, yeah. Because once you've put all those layers together, they'll then require a little bit more tweaking. So starting off first in the chain, we've got uh, our DSA. We slip away, yeah. Which isn't actually doing a lot. I suspect that at certain places in the vocal, those S's might build up quite loudly and it would kick in at a later stage. We've then got the C6 doing some multiband. We slip away, yeah. Again, just tickling. We slip away, yeah. About 3 dB in the tops. CLA 2A compressor. We slip away, yeah. Next up, we've got Clarifonic DSP Mark II. It's one of my godsend plugins really it's you know that magic air we slip away yeah we slip away yeah we slip away yeah whatever wizardry is going on inside it um just makes things sound sweeter the harder you push them in the tops more or less at the end of the chain we've got l1 limiter which um, yeah it's just keeping everything controlled we slip away yeah Around the time of, of making this track, I was really experimenting with my voice and my vocals and trying to find out what works, what doesn't work. One of those ideas was um, to try and create a choir out of my voice. It actually really worked in this track as a sort of like additional hook. We've got this section here, I'll play it to you. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, and what you've got there is just so many layers of my voice, we're just layering, layering, and layering. If I play one of the individual tracks, we'll just uh, bypass some of that. So everything's like panned left and right at different places in the stereo fields, you know, to really create that width. Whoa. Whoa. And yeah, we're just like layering and layering. Whoa. Whoa. And essentially that's just me singing that one part over and over and over again, tracking and tracking. Whoa. For this I didn't use my usual UAD template. Um, I, I think I, I wanted to lay it down quite quickly, so Nectar's like a really good way of just like instant gratification, just like stick it on and it will work kind of thing. Whoa. It's really like pushing. It's like compressor quite hard. We've got some like dynamic EQ here. Whoa. And we've got static EQ there. We've got Avox, which, yeah, th like this usually ends up on a lot of my individual vocal takes because it's just such a good all round compressor. It's just, I love the simplicity of it. It's got two dials, gate and comp. Whoa. Whoa. Fab Photo Pro MB. So yeah, I'm, I'm controlling a lot of that sort of boxiness around like 700. Whoa. Taming are quite a lot of these highs here. Whoa. But we're also pushing those back up when the amplitude of the vocal gets lower. Um, and then we've got the Waves Doubler, which yeah, I mean, I've been using this for years. It's great, you know, for that choir sound. And recently I've, I've actually been using Harmony Engine to achieve a similar effect. Normally I'll have this on a bus. And then, um, yeah, just to round things off, I've got the Valhalla Vintage Verb. I mean, that's swimming reverb, that's 78%. And it's happening inside the Sanctuary mode, which, um, yeah, I kind of wanted that like big kind of cathedral sort of like, yeah, epic thing. So um, yeah, that worked quite well. I was, uh, it was an experiment to see what would happen. I liked it a lot and it, and it was hooky and it really worked with the song, I think. It's like a, you know, like a B hook. Just to delve into what else is going on in the vocal breakdown in the intro. Yeah, essentially we've got this like low pass Reese patch here.
So this is a patch I made in Serum and it's essentially quite a simple low pass resound. What's going on here is a LFO modulating the warp on bend mode here, changing the harmonics, subtly shifting in the waveform. And then I've got that on a three unison, so three voices there to kind of give it that, you know, real kind of Reese sound because by itself it's I like the idea of being able to control that LFO and like to keep that kind of consistent throughout the pitch of the sound. So yeah, it's just giving it a bit more movement. Like interestingly with this sound, it's a single MIDI note. Um, and there were some articulations of the notes which I kind of felt needed to come in later or sooner. Glide wasn't really giving me the control to do that. So yeah, I flipped up the pitch bend to eight and essentially just drew it in. We've got a, a high pass filter here, taking away some of that low end and driving up some of those um, harmonics. So basically I've just rooted only oscillator A into the filter and removed the low end frequencies there. Um, I then added the sub layer here. Got the acoustic guitar running in there and we've got some like bass things to kind of introduce the track that it's things are kind of getting a bit more harder and a bit more metallic. And that's all ducking out to the kick drum. And that's uh, being controlled by Elephoto here. So I've created like a... And then essentially what I'm doing is I'm controlling the LFO depth here to switch it on or off. I didn't want it fully wet. So I pushed it up to 84 every time the kick drum comes in. It felt better to me rather than cutting out all of the sound uh, to make room for the kick. Sometimes leaving a little bit in there is actually more suitable. So yeah, that really created that like big impact when those kicks were coming in with the guitar and the synth stings. I've also got like the sub here. I wanted that sound to be quite full, you know, because when it comes in, it's like, okay, right, we, we've arrived at the build-up now and something big's going to happen. At this point, we've got the vocal choir chant coming in. And then we are building up the music elements as we're heading into the job. And like the most significant element here is the introduction of the guitars. So I had this vocal idea for a while and I kept singing it over the old sketch that I'd written. I was thinking about what would be the best way to execute it. And when I paired it with this guitar part, it just suddenly clicked. That was quite a, a big moment for me in the studio where I felt like everything was suddenly making sense and I'd really like stumbled on the cornerstone of my sonic identity on this album and um, just feels very instinctive and very natural. Originally, I tried doing the guitar myself with my electric. It just wasn't quite sounding right in the mix. So I thought I'd have a play around with this Native Instruments virtual instrument called a uh, Session Guitarist Electric Sunburst. I mean, it just sounds incredible. So what that allowed me to do was to program the guitars in MIDI. If we look into what's happening, we've got... Take off the event. So I've gone for like a palm muted feel for this. And then we're just distorting it. We've got our amps and cabinets all kind of like lined up here. It just made a lot of sense to use it. It filled up the mix really nicely. I've also got that layered with some sample guitars. And that's just in mono to fill up a bit of space. And there was like a, a harmonic in there that I quite like, creating a bit more kind of musicality to the guitar part. And it almost sounds like a harmonic bass layer. Um, but essentially what I did was I just, I chopped it and then sort of pitched it 
used that same chop and pitched it through different notes, which gave it kind of a consistency. Whereas the, uh, the the kind of live guitars are a lot more inconsistent with the sort of fluctuations and harmonics and stuff. So I, like, I quite like having a layer there in the background just to kind of try and help uh, keep those otherwise quite wild harmonics quite controlled. Like I said earlier about using the different sidechain techniques, I mean, firstly, we've got this to kind of like, to really sort of exaggerate the staccato feel of the groove. And um, I've got the LFA tool kind of doing quite a severe chop on the eighth note. Um, and I've kind of like ramped that up in places, so. And, that, and then sort of pulled it back as the guitar riff kind of opens up again. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we've got here, we've got, again, LFO tool, which is ducking out our guitar against the kick and snare transient. That helps the, the kick and snare, like, really punch through. Um, and, you know, you can sort of, like, be as sort of extreme as you want with that. But I think this was kind of more or less the right measure for what I was going for. And then... Uh, if we have a look here, so SC build. So yeah, that's basically just giving me a little bit more subtle ducking against the kick and the snare in the build-up. It just was sounding a little bit too like muddy. You really want people to feel those those drum build-ups coming in, the, the, the kick and the snare and really feel it in your chest and that kind of dynamic sort of like explosive interplay between the surrounding elements and the kick and the snare and, and essentially that's what was missing until I put this sidechain compression in. I just exaggerate it. Yeah, another thing I like to do sometimes is just to assign these thresholds to the macro here so I can fine tune it with one, one knob. Rolling into this, we've got like the sidechain trigger here, which was again, you know, like another way I do things. I think because this project spanned quite like a large development period, I was just trying out loads of different sidechain techniques. And yeah, at the time, this one sort of seemed to work quite well. Essentially what we've got going on there is um, I've got a MIDI trigger here, sidechain trigger, which is replicating the kick and snare drum pattern. And then on the electric guitar, we've essentially got the MIDI rooted into these two uh, LFO tools here. Uh, important to put them into EMV, envelope note re-triggering mode, otherwise it won't work properly. And uh, yeah, again, I've got this like uh, controlling of the kind of like dry and wet effect here, which um, is assigned to the volume here. Um, yeah, another thing you can do if you want to sort of like control the sort of like knee, I guess, or the exponentiality of the curve, you could do that. So you could create even more extreme ducking. What you're getting there, and something I delved into in my computer music masterclass was that when you're using MIDI notes to trigger LFO tools, um, everything is uh, locked to the MIDI clock and you're getting zero latency with this method. Um, so you're not getting any kind of pops and clicks and things being kind of slightly out of time. Um, so yeah, I, I like that kind of precise way of working, although it's a little bit cumbersome to set up. Because essentially what you have to do is you have to create a new sort of like MIDI trigger for each instrument you want to sidechain, which I don't think is a particularly fast way of working, but yes. Yeah, a bit of EQ. Nothing too scary. And then we've got, I mean like these guitars by themselves were just like ridiculously wide, so. So I was just pulling that in a bit. And especially with the lead, uh, which I'll go into next, the lead was super wide as well. So I wanted to make sure that the mix sounded very focused. And that's obviously a territory you want to be careful about when you're sort of working with very wide pan guitars, especially in like a, the context of a drum and bass track, because I think if I was going for that like super wide feel, it would kind of steer the track in a more rocky direction. And I kind of wanted to keep things sounding fairly electronic without emphasizing guitars too much. I was looking for like the right lead sound and I tried a few synths and they, they weren't really working and um, 
yeah, then I arrived at this, which almost happened by accident. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't really sound like much by itself. It's actually part of this. So yeah, this is the vocal I recorded in the hotel room in Berlin um, at like two in the morning or something before I was heading off to the club. If you just listen to the whole thing, it's quite funny because it's like my original raw take. We slip away, yeah, the gravity to fire, we're falling through the light. We slip away, yeah. Let gravity defy. We're falling through the light. Let gravity defy. Yeah, so as you can hear, it's very raw, very rugged. Um, literally just recorded on my laptop in a hotel room. Um, but yeah, I knew I, I had something good with that vocal. I think what happened was I accidentally looped the end of the vocal and I, I was just hearing this. I was like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so I threw it into a sampler and, and then created a melody out of it. And then we arrived at this. We've got nectar with a gate, just to get rid of those nasty sort of like rumbles. Um, pretty hefty EQ, DSR. Uh, oh, another EQ. And yeah, limiter. And then yeah, up here is kind of where you're getting most of the sort of effect going on. So yeah, kicking things off, we've got like Echo Boy delay, which is just like quite a quick slapback delay to give it kind of roominess. I've done the chain here. We've got like the wet and dry, so I'm able to side chain compress the wet signal against the dry. And then we've got Valhalla Vintage Verb. Yeah, then we've just got like OTT here. Let's kind of push everything up. Bit of EQ, and then finally we've got the Joey Sturgis gain reduction, which I use a lot. It does a very similar thing to OTT, but essentially just like one knob to kind of. I think there's a bit of multi-band compression going on there, mainly limiting. It's not really doing much colouring to the EQ, but you know helps things sound super large, especially if you're working with quite like a short reverb tail. You can actually get them to sound like monstrous. So yeah, that's essentially the lead, and we'll hear that in context of the track. LFO tool again, just kind of duck into the kick and snare. I didn't want anything too dramatic. I, I hate it when things sound too pumpy. Like I always have believed that you should never be able to hear sidechain compression unless it's used for like a deliberate groove effect. So yeah, just a bit of uh, heavy lifting EQ on the uh, vocal here, because there's a lot of like weird resonances now, and that obviously comes with recording something into a vocal where you've got like a fan spinning inside a computer and all sorts of weird room resonances, you know, you're never going to get like a perfect source. So um, yeah, so this was effectively used to control some of those weird resonances, because that, that one was particularly jumping out. Obviously it's very tonal and that, yeah, that is, effectively part of the melody. So you want to be careful about taking away too much of this kind of stuff. You want to make sure your fundamental, when you're working with like lead elements, your fundamentals are like right, right up front in the mix and consistent. And obviously, because this is a, a repeated vocal, uh, each iteration of that fundamental will be consistent. But yeah, I mean, with, without, without this going on, you know, you can really see how that harmonic there is, way too loud in comparison to the fundamental. Yeah, that one's really kind of like sticking out as well. So yeah, just rain that one in. Again, yeah, so, and you, you'll notice here that I've used like the dynamic mode in uh, Pro Q3, which um, it's kind of like a multi-band um, compressor in a way because it's taken down those peaks based on the amplitude and can help give you more of like a transparent EQ sound. In the past, I might have like drawn those curves in, whereas this is kind of like a quick way of doing that, I suppose. Um, yeah, cool, so that's, uh, that is the lead, the lead. Yeah, again, we've got this running all the way through. Free full pad again just to create that familiarity, that subliminal message or the subliminal link to the past. The subs are really simple in this track. Um, I originally had like an eighth 
staccato groove going on, but it, it was just too much. Um, and there was enough energy there in, in the, the rhythm and groove of the drums and all the rest of the elements to sort of allow me to use like a sustained uh, sub note to carry the low end of the track. I should just get rid of that. So yeah, it's just a patch I made called like Thick Sub and uh, you know, essentially what you've got going on here. Yeah, this is quite like a harmonic rich sub. So yeah, if I just start from scratch here, um, and yeah, so just like one sine wave there, like how I would create this sub is basically like, you know, I draw in the extra harmonics because like, like this is this is almost like mixing, you know, like because what, what I'll do to like get the perfect kind of sub balance here or like the perfect sub tone would be to sort of like solo it alongside the lows and sort of kind of identify like what is missing from the electric guitar. Got two very prominent harmonics here but then we've got a lot of space missing here so we kind of want to fill up the rest of that range and essentially like what you can do is you can use the wavetable editor and serum to kind of like start mixing in those notes. So it's important to mention this track is in D, so when it hits the tonic, you know, that sub note is almost like, that would be inaudible in a lot of systems. Um, so, you know, we really want to kind of fill up that range. Like a lot of those like low harmonics in the electric guitar were like fluctuating and quite wild. Um, I wanted there to be an element where those harmonics were kind of like solid and consistent throughout the entire mix. So this was a good way of doing it. And that's why I, I introduced the, these additional harmonics here. I mean, I might normally just use the first harmonic, but in this case, you know, the, the extra two really worked. So if we flick back to the original, the original sub. And really what you're looking for when you're mixing the sub is like, is it communicating to the rest of the musical elements in the respect that are you hearing the full chord and is the emotion of that coming across and that sounds like a mad thing to say but if you essentially strip out a lot of those low harmonics and the fundamental you're not going to be able to hear the meaning of that chord so yeah other things to note random is on zero so the starting point of the oscillator will always start at zero uh, with each note change um, that's very important to kind of maintain like a sort of consistent phase across the entire pattern i like to have very precise control over the dynamics um, instead of using sidechain compression i'll always use something like lfo tool um, to to do the work and in this case i've got the sub completely ducking out when the kick occurs and likewise when the snare occurs and yeah if i if i actually just solo the kick and snare here so you can hear what's going on and then if i put like a low like a low pass on that so yeah th this is what i often do and and it really helps to have my um oscilloscope for this bit because So I've got my kick and snare here. We can see the low end, just the low end of the kick and snare. And then I'll introduce the sub. So you can really see where to carve out the kick and the snare, the snare like visually, like here. Um, you know, some people don't like to cut as much out, um, particularly on the snare drum, but um, for me, it, it allows you to get the amplitude of the snare and kick fundamental as loud as possible without distorting or any phase issues. Another thing quite crucial to mention is like about how, about where you draw these curves because so if I was to like just leave that as a straight line, you can hear that audible popping. So to completely avoid any interference between the decay of that sub going into the next kick or snare sample, um, you know, you can just roll off the back of it here and, and actually you're kind of getting a bit a bit more definition on, on, on the drum hits doing it this way. I mean, like equally, I could actually just pull all these out and go to smooth here. The pops and clicks are gone, but what we've actually done is we've put curves on these extreme ledges, which are actually bleeding into 
the start of the next sample. So I'd really advise not using smooth in this case. You want to be really careful with this, this area of mixing because things can very quickly start to sound quite sloppy. So uh, yeah, anyway, this is my method. And moving into the B section, yeah, again, we've just brought the vocal back in here and originally I wanted to put in a counter melody. And yeah, that's essentially just a very simple pluck. But yeah, to me that just sounded a little bit too like trancey and it didn't quite have enough grit for the overall production. Um, so again, I drafted in my old friend, the, the Prophet 6, and once again it delivered and, it, and I was able to get in that creative space where I could come up with a sound that fitted the project perfectly. Fab Fiddle sat, sat in here. Drive it up a little bit. And then finally, we've got Echo Boy and... Val had a vintage verb. By having the uh, delay on a quarter note pattern, notes of the melody harmonised with the other notes in the melody, and they play off each other as the melody progresses. The key to that sound, if I remember rightly, was using um, the Prophet's unison function, which essentially lays up the sound, fattens it, and it's got a really nice built-in chorus as well. A sound that I've used a lot throughout my new album is this distorted sawtooth synth sound that's very reminiscent of the first Blade Runner soundtrack. And it makes an appearance here. It's a patch I created in Serum, alternating between the A and the E. Kind of harmonised nicely with the rest of what else was going on. Lots of voices, multiple layers, 16 on each oscillator. We've used a sub oscillator here for an extra sawtooth. Some white noise. I mean, it's your classic super saw sounds, you know, so quite a simple sound to make. It's all about the detuning of these oscillators. Steve Dude is a bit of a legend. If you want more voices, just crank them in here, you know? And yeah, in this case, I just sort of had that dialed back a bit, just for a bit more of an expansive sound, and then distortion here. Yeah, kind of angry, kind of like the, the Blade Runner remake rather than the original. We've got Valhalla Vintage Verb just taking care of the you know, I've used this amazing vocal preset here, just dialed out the decay a little bit. That isn't really that interesting, so I'll move on to the next thing. This really is just like stock metric stuff that has been on different tracks and it's kind of layered with other ones. I mean, this is from a collab with Dibba Josh, Josh Graphics. Called Skyline. And then this is frequency shift rise. That's just a square wave going through a frequency shifter. And frequency shift is just brilliant for risers. Like I've, I'll put anything I can through it. So as you can see, it's literally, yeah, that riser I've just mentioned, it's literally just doing this. We're just automating the coarse pitch as it's going up. You can even add a little bit of an exponential poke at the end. It's easy to kind of try and bury risers quite a lot but don't be afraid to kind of bring them up and make it sound like there's something big about to happen, you know? So I looped the delay tail of the vocal and I used the frequency shifter just to like lift it up and kind of turn it into a riser in itself. So because this track drops on A sharp, which is quite high um, as a sub note, um, I wanted the driving force of the low end to be the kick drum. So I think the kick was just like a love child of like Hackers and Dawnbreaker, I'm fairly sure. I literally just pitched down the kick drum, one semitone, which worked really nicely. The snare is the Dawnbreaker snare. And, you know, it was already a pretty accomplished snare to be honest. But then to sort of like adapt it to 
the aesthetic of this track I felt it needed something else so I added this 80s layer which um, in isolation <clears throat> without any processing sounds like this yeah so again that's like from Sennheiser loads of like amazing sort of 80s sounds and then I applied some effects to it so just to walk you through that so yeah I've gained it up a little bit I've stuck it in mono I didn't want it to be a super kind of like roomy snare I've used LFO tool to control the dynamics. So that's completely cutting away the transient. I've also got quite a steep curve, like okay, a volume increase to kind of give it that punch, you know, that, that punch is not about slamming things. It's about taking things away and the relationship between loud and quiet. So here, you know, if you want to get a, a layer sounding super kind of punchy, you do it by creating volume fade. Next up, we've got some EQ. More EQ. Get that kind of top end fizz. I think that's what I was looking for. And then, yeah, just to round that off, I mean, like saturation, and in this, this case, like overdrive, um, it's a really good way of smudging top end frequencies, kind of like white noiseify something. I do this a lot with my, my drum layers, like the top layers, so without, and then with. And then if we apply that to the snare drum, and then without, it's making it sound much more focused, particularly in mono. To bring that together, I used Pro MB by FabFilter. That's essentially kind of taking away some of the tops on the transient and pushing them back up in the tail. Going into the tops, show you what I've got going on there. We've got our hats. Hacker's hat but with uh, some pretty hefty EQ. Got that kind of sidechain-ish thing going on. DS10 drum shaper, I wanted them to have a lot more sustain and loudness in the decay. Kind of added to like the splashy rock feel of the drums, rather than it being like too tight and controlled. Got a little perk layer there, which I like to add underneath hats sometimes if there's not a lot of lowing going on in them anyway. And then moving into the cymbals, which is, yeah, really a combination of cymbals I use from other tracks, like, you know, it's very like straight, like aggressive ride going on. Just like lots of splashiness, always good to fill up that top end. Yeah, this top loop, um, it's got super like loads of energy in it. And these are the kind of like your rocky drums. I I, managed, I think I scooped out like a lot of low end in these sounds, uh, whether or not it's printed into the sounds themselves or not. I've got this side chain pattern going on here. So like a bit of a, like a sort of burst of, of volume increase at the beginning and then kind of a bit of a dip before the snare. So that sort of like insinuates that first snare drum groove like I find. So that's a pattern that worked for this track. I mean, it's, it's actually quite hard to hear, but when you hear it in context the rest of the track, it, it's sort of like, it feels right. The track's quite like moody and atmospheric, but at the end I kind of wanted this like triumphant feel. And the way I got there was through this string part. Yeah, and those strings, Session Strings Pro 2, like, Awesome sounding library, like really like impressively sort of put together. And just programmed in the MIDI. And I, I think what is effective about these strings is that if you're doing a piano line, you might have each chord starting, you know, sequentially. Whereas if you have some of the notes overlapping and then sort of like undulating, you can create a string part that evolves really nicely without any sudden or jarring uh, chord changes. And it's also, you know, if you're thinking about like a violinist or a cellist playing, they're bowing, you know, they're not going to be doing any kind of sudden movements. So you want these long pad like string sections to feel quite natural like that. So just to round things off, I came up with this additional vocal part. Uh, quite late in the writing process and um, yeah, check it out. I 
I wanted something which kind of had a reference to the main body of the song to really hit home that feeling of resolution. takes us into the end of the track. Um, I added uh, these acoustic guitars. Those added sort of relief from an otherwise quite intense track and um, you know, while still being in keeping with that sort of rocky aesthetic, they worked really nicely with the vocal in the end. Uh -huh. 